here. Uh, <laughs> delight to be here. You know, I grew up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, way up there, uh, Lake Superior, south of us, where, where I lived, actually was Sault Ste. Marie, and uh, Sudbury was about the same level. We liked to, you know, it was so cold there. It was really cold up there. It's, it, that we would we would have to dress up in the winter time with heavy coats, jump in the car, drive south somewhere warm, like Green Bay, Wisconsin. <laughs> but uh, I don't want to talk about that today. Uh, actually, what I want to talk about is really the title of the talk. It's um, voting, how it can go wrong. And when I came here, I heard a rumor. I heard a rumor that you're going to have an election coming up soon. <laughs> okay. Actually, you see, an election coming up here is very, I, I spent, as, as Chandler nicely stated, I spent uh, uh, a couple of decades at Northwestern University, and my house was right here at the border of Chicago. And you know Chicago. <laughs> On election day in Chicago, we would have something different. We would hear, vote early. Vote often. Aha, <laughs> okay. uh -huh, you've been from Chicago, I can tell by that line. Okay, <laughs> but there's something different when I was reading the newspapers here uh, from the Toronto newspapers and I would see things like strategic voting. Yep, there it is, strategic voting or the pitfalls of uh, plurality or first past the post or ranked voting methods, all sorts of interesting things which made my preparation for the lecture so easy. <laughs> Because reading the newspapers, there were a lot of comments of what is it? Are these methods good or are they bad? And I figured, well, hey, what I'll do here is I'll, I'll just show you what are some of these things. I'll explain to you what are these different voting methods and the different approaches. And I'll tell you what's good and what's bad. Now, interesting fact is the answers. You would think that the answers come from political science, wouldn't you? That's an area that looks at voting? The answer is no. It turns out that the intricacies, the complications involved, are such that they can really only be answered by use of mathematics. And so what I'm going to do is, in fact, a lot of these issues have been studied since, oh, uh, well, actually a couple millennia ago. But to be able to get answers, it's only recently when we're using mathematics. And the mathematics is fairly complicated. Don't worry. The mathematics to get the results is complicated, but to describe them, you only need to count. So, you're, so don't worry about that, and I will promise you, no quiz at the end, okay? <laughs> now, what was the big thing we heard about is strategic voting. And the natural issue to ask is, what is this thing called strategic voting? And uh, so I'll give you an answer. The answer is that strategic voting, uh, to tell you what is strategic voting, let me tell you what it's not. It's not sincere voting. And sincere voting is where? It's where you got your preferences. You prefer Anne to Barb to Connie and never mind what the newspapers say. Never mind what all those brochures that are stuffing your mailbox say. You're going to vote according to your preferences and Barb and Connie. So that's sincere voting. Now, what happens is strategic voting. I like to compare strategic voting to a game of poker. Okay? What happens is in strategic voting, what you're doing is you, in poker, what do you do is you see what's on the table. And you say, huh, huh, can I bluff? Should I vote sincerely, which would like my card show, or should I bluff? Same thing with strategic voting. You're not voting sincerely, you're looking at what the polls and everything else say. And you're saying, hey, is there a personal advantage for me to vote strategically? That's what happens. But just like in poker, some you win, and you know the rest of it. <laughs> some you're going to lose on that. There is another issue. The other issue is, we talk about it, and your newspapers have been full of strategic voting, you know, that we should or shouldn't. Will people do it? 
even if they say they will? Oh, excuse me, I'm a little bit ahead of myself. Sincere voting. This is Sunday. And so sincere voting sounds so virtuous. Not necessarily. There are times when sincere voting, you're forced to do so. You don't have a choice, you're forced to. Let me, let me give you an example. Suppose we have Ann and Barbara running against each other. And your preferences happen to be you prefer Ann to Barb. You have two ways to vote. You can vote for Ann if you do that sincere voting. You could vote for Barb. That's stupid. So what happens then is with two candidates, the uh, theorem is that with two candidates, you cannot vote strategically. You cannot vote strategically at all. Okay? And that's because it's either here or there. Here is what I want to do. That's sincere anyway. And here is hurting what I want to do. It's silly. Aha. But with three candidates now, for three candidates, or more candidates, it's not here or here, it's here, here, or there. And I'm giving you the image of two dimensions. It's this higher dimensionality which makes strategic voting possible. And we already know when and how to use it with the plurality vote. If you don't, pick up any newspaper that's, uh, in Toronto that's been out there for the last two weeks. It'll explain precisely how to vote strategically. When is strategic voting a possibility in with the plurality vote? In my case, if I prefer Anne to Barb to Connie, Connie might win. Anne's my favorite, but Barb has a better chance. So I would not vote for my top ranked candidate, which would be sincere. I would rank for my second ranked candidate to avoid my bottom ranked candidate from getting elected. If there are five candidates, the same thing. Maybe a lower ranked candidate, I would vote for a higher has a chance. In other words, this is under, we've heard a lot of time, don't waste your vote is what we hear across the board. Well, that's what they say. But will voters vote strategically? I looked at the poll results this morning. I don't think there's going to be much strategic voting tomorrow. But what happens is, let's look at an election which was very close, south of the border. Remember that one? Oh boy. <laughs> you should remember it. It's changed our world. Okay. What happens is, Bush and Gore and Nader. There are all sorts of campaigns in the newspapers all across the country saying for the Nader voters, vote for Gore. What happened is uh, the uh, people in Florida says, I, I don't know if we can do that. We want to get enough votes for the Green Party or whatever the name of the party was. People from California, where Gore was going to win overwhelmingly, said, look, we'll trade votes. Going on across the country, I mean, talk about, hey, Toronto, strategic voting, not bad at all compared to what was in the press at that time. And in fact, what happened is Doonesbury, on that election day, remember the cartoon Doonesbury? Yeah, on election day it had, if you don't, I can't put it up here, it's copyright, but, <laughs> but if you just go look up in Doonesbury on election day, you'll see the cartoon. And it was a cartoon that Doonesbury was giving to the Nader voters saying, you want this to happen? Nader voters wouldn't want that. You want this to happen? He said, what's, you know where you can get all these horrible things? Vote for Nader. Actually, by the way, all those things came to pass. Um, and so what happens is, I have never seen such an outright push for strategic voting as we had here. Never. What happened? Well, when people get into the voting booth, what they think strategically and what they do can be very different. 
it, what happens then is precisely in New Hampshire, Nader got a very strong vote, you know, for the, across the country, strong vote. If about half of the Nader voters voted, had voted for Gore, we would have had President Gore. In Florida, same thing. There, even a smaller percentage of the uh, uh, Nader voters, if they had voted for Gore, we would have had President Gore. So there is a reasonable amount of evidence, and there's other elections, but I'm going to show you elections where there's a lot of strategic voting too. But there's a large number of uh, situations where strategic voting need not play the serious role that people worried about. What's going to happen tomorrow? I have no idea. I already told you I don't believe there's going to be that much. Now, let's get to some of the press reports. We know how to vote strategically with the uh, plurality vote. We have some mathematicians here. Mathematicians, you go home and you invent a method that's strategy proof. Shouldn't be that hard. So I want you to go home and invent the method which is strategy proof. The reason it shouldn't be so hard is I read several press releases, not several, a couple of them, in Toronto papers saying that such and such a method is strategy proof. You've read them. So let, let's, 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 let's take a look. Suppose we have the following voting method. You have three candidates and I'm asking you to vote for two. Is that strategy proof? question I want you to do is, well, I'm giving you a challenge. In what situations may someone want to be strategic? Who would want to be strategic? And how would they be strategic? Folks, this is a simple system. The method you would use here doesn't work. You have a different situation when you want to be strategic and you have different strategies. Well, try it out, try it out, that's your homework assignment. <laughs> Do it tomorrow by 10 o'clock, okay? <laughs> the fact is, this is, you can be strategic here, but it's not obvious. Then if I give you something else, like let's give six points to a first place candidate, two points to a second place candidate, and zero to your last. Can you be strategic there? That's the ranked method that the newspapers have been saying pretty much Strategy free? Answer is yeah. But how? There's an infinite number of different methods, and so that's why, that's why this problem is hard. Can you create a strategy proof method? That means out of all possibilities, can you get one? You can't look at all possibilities, there's an infinite number of them. On the other hand, it would be a source of an infinite number of PhD dissertations, but, <laughs> but maybe not useful ones, <laughs> okay? And so the answer is no, it's impossible when you have three or more candidates. It's totally impossible. The mathematical reasoning is pretty much that one of either here or there or up there and we get to higher dimensions. And this was proved 40 years ago, 41 years ago, by Alan Gibbard and Mark Satterthwaite. They did so independently. And they proved that it's impossible to create a method by use a uh, strategy-proof method. So any method that you read in the paper and they say, hey, strategy-proof, the answer is no, it's not. Now, some methods may be more strategically susceptible than others, but all of them can, are strategy-proof. I mean, are sub subject to being manipulated, all of them. And this, again, shows you, by the way, the muscle power of mathematics, doesn't it? And the reason we see a lot of the things in the press about saying this method or that method is strategy proof, it's that you can't think of a strategy. You can't think of one. Well, I'm having, you may have a little trouble finding when and how one can be strategic if you vote for two out of three. Just because you have trouble finding one doesn't mean it's strategy proof. And so again, this is an illustration of the muscle power of mathematics to be able to handle large number of these, these types of concerns. 
On the other hand, voting strategically is voting against personal beliefs. Boy, when I was growing up, I don't know how many times I heard, be careful what you wish for, it might come true. Be careful what you vote for, it might come true, which is what you said earlier today. You can get what you voted for. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples where people got what they voted for, <laughs> not what they wanted in voting for. First one is in 19, uh, 1971. Paul Simon was running for governor of the state of Illinois. Simon had an incredible record. Good government man, very solid. Highly, highly supported. It was going to be a landslide. But what Simon did is to ensure he got more votes is he went to Mayor Richard Daley of Chicago and asked for an endorsement, which angered a lot of Simon's supporters. They still wanted Simon, but they wanted to send a message. They wanted to send a message that you do not toy with us. So they thought enough of them were going to vote against Paul Simon, just to send a message. Too many did. <laughs> they got what they voted for, unfortunately. Dan Walker won, went on to become governor, and a decade later he spent some time in jail. <laughs> Illinois, by the way, being governor, if you look at the record, we, we, we managed to send several of them off <laughs> to prison. <laughs> well, we're, uh, we're productive. Okay. <laughs> Another one, 2002, France. Joe Spen, strong favor, very strong favor. Again, plurality vote. 16 candidates. 16 candidates were running for our election. And all my French friends tell me, you know, it's a two-stage election. The first stage, we vote strategically. And then what we do is, then we get down to the serious business and we vote for who we want. Remember that election? Yeah. So it's been lost, he came in third. And we had an election between Chirac and Le Pen. And the news media was filled with articles, what's happening to France? Are they becoming right wing? Are they becoming radicalized? Are they becoming et cetera, et cetera? No, it was just number one, you used a stupid voting method. And number two, people voted strategically. That's what was wrong. And indeed, when they had the final election, Shows, uh, Le Pen only got slightly more votes than he did in the primary. And so uh, more than the ample proof of that. So strategic voting can backfire. It can be dangerous. All right. Now, in other words, what you do need is you need accurate information to be able to vote strategically. If they had accurate information about how many people were going to vote strategically with Paul Simon, he would have been governor. If they had accurate information about how many people were going to vote for other parties to send a message in France, then Justin would probably would have won. But you don't always get the accurate information. Remember I said strategic voting is like what's on the table? Poker? Well, folks, what you have may be bad information and you can get hurt. But this question of needing accurate information has led to what France did for a while. They, uh, if they have it now, it's ineffective. They said that you cannot release polls of where people stand for the week before the election. The purpose of that was to deprive you of the information to be strategic, okay? But now with internet, that's, that's impossible. There's another method which I will talk a little bit about, and that is if we can create a voting system which is complicated enough that I have trouble figuring out how to be strategic. <laughs> okay. and, and, and in fact, 
hard, you're going to see that's not hard to do, but uh, it has to be done. Okay, now, whoops, but often, and this is where I'm going next, what drives people to vote strategically manifests inadequacies of your current voting system. That the current voting system is what forces you to be, vote strategically. All right? And I definitely say that's true for the plurality vote, as you will see. So this is what we're going to do, and let's look at the inadequacies of the voting rule. Now, I had planned to give them some examples of what's going right and what's going wrong on some of these things in terms of, oh, I don't know, I chose three names, Chow, Ford, and uh, Tory, but I was told that might be sensitive, so I shouldn't use that sample. <laughs> so I um, decided I would just talk about a party. We all like parties. And what we're going to have to do is it's time to have, you know, times are tough always, particularly in universities. And what we have to do is we can have only a single beverage to serve at the party. So a committee of 15 is selected to select the common beverage. Six of them really like milk. They really like milk. If that's not available, wine second place, beer last. Five, they're from Wisconsin. <laughs> beer, wine, and milk. And four, hey, they're from California. <laughs> they like wine. <laughs> okay. And so what happens is there's a conflict here. So you have to decide how are we going to, which beverage are we going to have? You can only have one beverage. So you vote. Six vote for milk. Five vote for beer. Four vote for wine. So we're going to have milk. <laughs> okay. So they get into the car. And they drive down to the local beverage store to buy a keg of milk. <laughs> when they get there, they said, Whew, are you lucky you didn't want beer? We had a large number of people from the RCI there last night, and they just cleaned us out. <laughs> well, no big deal. Milk's first, wine's last. You still take milk, right? I mean, it's obvious. I don't know anyone who wouldn't. And, and, and I'm just if any skeptics, let me show you. OK, yep, six people here. They like milk. And, Wait a minute, some Thai people prefer wine to milk? Sixty percent of these voters prefer last place wine to first place milk. Now let's see what else happens. Milk and beer. Oh, nine people prefer beer to milk. Take a look. What do we have? We have that milk is in first place using the method that you're going to use tomorrow morning. Starting at what, 10 o'clock? Uh, <laughs> starting at 10 o'clock, the method you're going to use tomorrow morning, the plurality vote. And yet, by use of other methods, we find out that these people prefer anything to your first place choice of milk. And I have to agree, I prefer anything to milk, too. But <laughs> And now there's only one other choice, and so let's go for that, beer and wine. All right, let's take a look. Oh, up here, the wine over beer, wine over beer. We have two-thirds of the people prefer wine over beer. Folks, the method you're going to trust tomorrow morning, or tomorrow night, says that wine's in first place, and beer, uh, in last place, and milk's in first place, and in fact, what we learn from the pairwise comparison, the paired comparisons, is that the outcome is exactly the opposite. Last place wine beats anything. And anything beats first place milk. I want to give you several actual examples where this has cropped up in elections. Most from the United States, but one from Canada. So uh, the flaws of our voting system, it's serious. Now, I know that you like beer, don't you? You say, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. okay. How are you going to elect beer? How are you going to choose beer? 
<laughs> not by first pass the vote, that's for sure. Anyone tell me how we're going to elect beer here? By use of a standard method? Yeah, to elect beer. How are we going to elect beer? <laughs> yeah, get wine out of there. Fine. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use a runoff election. If I have a runoff election, what happens is wine is dropped and I have now an election between milk and beer. And beer is going to win. A simple example, folks. A very, very simple example. And what is it that we see? We see with milk with one, will win with one method. Beer will win with another method. And wine will win with a third. If that doesn't bother you, it should. <laughs> because really, what does it say? It says, rather than reflecting what the voters want, an election outcome, particularly the plurality vote or first past the post, an election outcome can more accurately reflect what election method you happen to use. OK? And so the question is why? And I'm going to a little bit introduce some of the reasons why this is so. But first, let's look at some examples. The first example I have, I grew up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, as Chandler nicely stated, where right next to the state of Minnesota. You know, where all the children are above average, et cetera. And so what happens in Minnesota is they had Hubert Humphrey's son, Skip Humphrey, running for governor. He was a very, very popular attorney general, a very popular attorney general. Running against Humphrey was Norm Coleman, a protege of Humphrey. But he decided that it'll take too long before he can get his, up, uh, you know, uh, his chance to run for something, so he ran on the Republican Party. The poll showed Humphrey just winning outrageously. Oh, by the way, a third candidate came in that none of them took seriously. Jesse, the body, Ventura. And I love comparing Jesse Ventura to milk. <laughs> because what happened is, here is our wine candidate right here. Here's our milk candidate, and you saw the election outcomes. Ventura won. He became governor for one term. He realized he didn't have a chance the second time around. Or at least, <coughs> that's what you can read from his press reports where give you that implication. An even worse one was in Louisiana in 1991. In 1991, Buddy Romer was running for re-election uh, in the state of Louisiana. Now let's take a look at who were his opponents. There were three. Again, Romer was wine. Another one was Edwin Edwards, a former governor. But let me tell you, I've never seen anything this harsh in any of the things I've seen in politics. And I, as a mathematician, I've learned to enjoy that. The Shreve Report newspaper, a journalist wrote, the only way Edwards, because of his past scandals, the only way Edwards can ever get reelected or get elected to any post is if he ran against Adolf Hitler. <laughs> Hitler was not available. But David Duke, head of the American neo-Nazi party, was the third candidate. There is no issue. Romer would have beaten Edwards. Romer would have beaten Duke. No issue at all. That's exactly what would have happened. Impaired comparisons. But they were using first past the post, what you're using tomorrow. They're using plurality vote, what you're using tomorrow. And what happens is we had the Crooker clan, Romer lost, and we had the Crooker clan run off. There were actual posters. Vote for the crook. Vote for the crook. <laughs> On the back of cards. Incredible. Incredible. I, oh, unbelievable. The uh, clan lost. And the crook won. And he went to prison after his term. <laughs> I mean, 
the, the, the virtues of having a good voting system, and uh, first past the post and plurality is not a good voting system, folks. Uh, the virtues of these things right here are, ooh, I mean, the consequences are significant. Now, I promised you one from Canada. I grew up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, the western Upper Michigan, right near Lake Superior, where we could hear music from Thunder Bay and Lakehead. Well, remember, there were two separate cities, right? And they consolidated. And when they consolidated, they had to come and choose a name. And Lakehead was winning, significantly. So some Thunder Bay supporters threw in a third alternative. <laughs> and the outcome, we have Thunder Bay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what happens then, folks, is that this, this phenomenon of the plurality vote not respecting the views of the voters. I, you know, mathematically, I can prove that up one side, down the other, but I thought for a general public, I would give you real examples where you see, hey, this isn't just mathematics off to the side. This is reality. This is reality. And so a mathematician's take on this, well, Okay, what can we do? How can we get around it? Are there ways to better reflect the views of the voters? Because that's the objective, right? <laughs> and so perhaps we can use, uh, how about using other weights to tally ballots? All right, and that started with Jean-Charles de Borda back in 1770. De Borda, French mathematician, did a lot of work in partial differential equations and water waves and things like this. And actually, he was chairman. He was chairman of the uh, committee to create the metric system, uh, the, the meter, et cetera, not, not the weights, but the uh, lengths. And a uh, very accomplished person. And he worried about the method that the French Academy of Sciences was using to elect new members to the Academy of Sciences. What was this horrible method? The plurality vote. So what goes wrong with the plurality vote? Suppose in your school district tomorrow morning, the superintendent says that from now on, all students will be ranked according to the number of A's they received. What's wrong with that? Anyone? Anyone have an idea what's wrong with that? Zoe? <laughs> That's right. Her answer is a correct one, is that with this method right here, a person could get an one A and all the rest, I'll go worse, all the rest Fs. Got an A in the gym course and Fs and everything else and would be ranked ahead of the student that got all Bs. Well, what's the plurality vote? The plurality vote is we're only voting for our A candidate. We're not allowed to mention our B, C, D, and E. And for that exact same reason, the plurality vote is so bad. And for that exact reason, people, what they do is they say that, okay, let's uh, try strategic voting to get my views across. It almost forces people into it. So Borda said, uh, said let's try po uh, giving points to our first, second, and third. This is the rank method that's in your paper a lot. Except what weights? Borda said that let's, um, that if I have three candidates, Anne, Barb, and Connie, my favorite, give Anne two, Barb uh, one, and Connie zero. Or if I have five candidates, A, B, C, D, F, give four, three, two, one, zero. ooh, that's our four point grading system, <laughs> okay. And so what happens is, this is what Borda put forth. But what happens is there's many, many other systems. And you see this in the newspapers about using rank methods. The question is, which rank method? Because if I use different rank methods, or the beverage example, I can get seven different election outcomes. Three are ties, but four are not. So therefore, using a rank method is not the cure-all. You've got to know which rank method you should use. 
because otherwise you can be in the same spot we are now. All right? In fact, that's a problem that Laplace, a well-known mathematician in Lagrange, said which method is best, which best respects the voters' views, and it's recently been solved by, well, by me by use of mathematics, and it uses mathematics symmetries of that ugly thing. Remember that thing? Remember how you would try to do it? You try to get his face all red first, and then you try to get the, ugh. What happens is to solve this, you have to use something, some symmetry, something called wreath product or permutation groups. I don't know what that means either. Uh, <laughs> but you have to use some sort of symmetries to be able to solve this type of problem. And the same thing is true in the voting type problems. All right. Good news and bad news. Good news. What happens is uh, for three candidates, well, bad news. Uh, bad news first. Three candidates. About seven, if you're using ranked methods, about 70% of the time, the outcome will depend on which ranked method you're talking about. You can get different outcomes if you use, you have your favorite ranked method, you have yours and you have yours, we get three different outcomes. 70% of the time you can get a different outcome. That shows this is a serious problem of finding out which ranked method to use. Secondly, oh, this is a paper uh, where the proof is if you want to see the proof of that. More candidates, the problems get worse. If you have four candidates, I have only nine voters here. We're going to have the teacher of the year. And we have Ann, Barb, Connie, and Deanna. See so up here, and we have two people prefer Ann to Barb to Connie to Deanna. Here I have three people prefer Deanna to Barbara to Connie to Ann. So they vote. Suppose they say vote for one. Well, vote for one. There's four people that prefer Ann. Nobody likes Barb. Two people like Connie and three people like Deanna. So Ann wins. Vote for two. Who's going to win? Barb's going to win. She has a large number of second place votes to make up for her, and so she wins. Vote for three. Now folks, before you count, <laughs> hard to count. Let's be honest, voting for three is voting against somebody, isn't it? It's a politically correct way to say I'm voting against someone. Okay? So we only have to see who you would vote against, who's bottom place ranked candidates, and we see, oh, a lot of people don't like uh, Deanna, a lot of people don't like Ann, Barb. Oh, Connie's the only one that isn't bottom ranked, so Connie will win. Wait a minute, wait a minute, nine people and I got three different election outcomes. It's going to get worse. Uh, three different election outcomes. So now what happens is, let's take the average in some sense. That's going to be the board account. See, and because you see, first place votes, one, 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 that's three. One, one, that's two, one. That's something like an average. Not quite, they're pretty close. Who do you think is going to win, Ann, Barbara, Connie? Deanna. <laughs> So what do we have here? We've got a, a trivial outcome right here. And Anne wins with one method, Barb wins with another, Connie wins with a third, and Deanna wins with a fourth. So the idea of using a ranked method is only the beginning of the conversation. Only the beginning of the conversation. Which ranked method? And what happens is I, I can prove that with this example, nine voters, I can get 18 different strict uh, election rankings by using different ranked methods. 18 of them. And about 85% of the time, ranking changes which with method you happen to select. Is this a serious problem? Oh, yes. So when you read in the paper about ranked methods, remember, that's just opening the dialogue. Now, let me give you another example to pile on and to talk about ranked methods, to pile on the plurality vote. Here I have a department that's going to try to hire a person. Again, Ann, Barb, Connie, and Deanna are the candidates. And I made this example very easily uh, because I have all Ann's votes right here. She has nine. All Barb, she has eight. All Connie, she has seven. All Deanna, she has six. And so therefore, the outcome is Ann, Barb, Connie, and Deanna. So what happens is the chair of the department calls up 
to go call Ann to offer her a job. But the phone rings. And Deanna says, I can't come. Uh, I'm going off to Harvard. <laughs> okay. So who should, she, uh, who should the chair call? I know of no department that wouldn't call Ann. She's first place. So let's, but let's take a look. Because Deanna is no longer a candidate. If they had a re-election, those people can't vote for Deanna, so they would vote for Barb. And these four voters can't vote for Deanna, so they would vote for Connie. And now Connie gets 11 votes, Barb gets 10, Anne gets 9. And the outcome switches, flips. Ouch. <laughs> okay. Now let's take a look. Suppose it wasn't Deanna, but suppose Anne says, no, 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 I, I, I can't. Uh, come on, Anne. Uh, <laughs> I, can't, uh, I can't come. Too warm in Toronto. I want to go farther north. Okay. <laughs> And so now what happens? Well, Barb, Connie, Deanna, I mean, that's clear. Let's take a look. Those three voters right there are not going to vote for Ann. They're going to vote for Connie. These six voters here are not going to vote for Ann. They're going to vote for Deanna. Twelve, ten, eight. It reverses. And in fact, what happens is that it doesn't really matter It doesn't matter. You drop any candidate or drop any two candidates and the outcome flips. It's just the opposite. So your first outcome is highly flawed because it really says that it should have been just the opposite should be the outcome. And so pairwise, it says that Deanna beats Anne. And actually, if you count, it's, uh, I think it's 9 to 21 that Deanna beats Anne. Deanna beats Barb by, I think it's 10 to 20. And Deanna beats Connie by, you know, landslide proportions. And she came in last. And it turns out that Connie beats Barb, and Connie beats Anne, and Barb beats Anne. That's your plurality vote if you use the first one, which is what you're going to do tomorrow. And so what happens is, I don't mean to pile on the plurality vote. Yes, I do. Uh, <laughs> you use any ranked method. You tell me how many points to give for a first place candidate, second place candidate, third place candidate, fourth place candidate. You tell me, any one of them. Maybe seven, five, one, zero. I don't care, you give me it. And I will create a simple example that has that same phenomena where the outcome and this outcome is just the opposite. Any, with one exception. The board account. For the board account, you give three, two, one. The board account is the only method and you can prove this mathematically by use of these symmetry type arguments I stated. It's the only method which will not suffer this indignity. Now, in Canada, you have a ranked method where what you do is you have an election, you drop the last candidate, and then you, you go on. And I saw so much in the press about how good that is. You know what I'm going to say. <laughs> it's not. And you know what's wrong with it? They have the instant runoff. An advantage of the instant runoff is that it's too darn complicated to try to figure out who's going to win and get to the next uh, stage. So it reduces strategic voting. It doesn't eliminate it, it reduces it. it. Makes it available only for the bright ones, very bright ones. And not enough very bright ones to make a difference. Okay, so strategic voting is, uh, is a possibility. But, 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 could you get a bad outcome? Could you get a bad outcome anyway, just because the system is flawed? And the answer is yes. The problem is, is that you're using the plurality vote at the first stage, the second stage, the third stage. You're trying to find a method for a disease, and you're putting a bandage on it and still using the disease. It's not going to work. You're still going to have flaws. Because let's take a look what happens. If with this example, at the first stage, what happens? Who gets killed? The first stage, it's Deanna gets dropped. The first stage, Deanna is the one that's dropped, the best one by far. 
she's dropped, and now what happens is your method's going to go on and select somebody else. And you're clearly not getting excellence. Okay, Don, that is a, you know, that's a theoretical issue, and that's not going to crop up in our elections. Yes, it will. In fact, you can show with a reasonably high probability something like that can happen. And in fact, I'll give you real-world examples. Remember that movie? Remember the movie about uh, down in Georgia, uh, the uh, Civil War, et cetera, Cold Mountain? High, high critical acclaim, high, high box office acclaim. For several of the top awards, it did not get selected. It was not nominated. And what method did they use in the Academy Awards? I just showed it to you. You have the plurality vote, drop your bottom candidate. And because of the inadequacies of the plurality vote at the first stage, it got dropped out. And so what happens is it just plain doesn't work. Here's another example. We're going to have the 2016 Olympics down in Rio. We already read about the possibility of difficulties, etc. Much closer to you, it was supposed to have been in Chicago. Chicago was the top candidate to win. They use precisely this method right here that I've been talking about that you use here. Plurality vote, drop the bottom one, continue. First vote, voters often have an excellent choice as their second place and their first choice as a thank you to certain cities for the nice uh, hosting they did to them when they came there to look over the city. So Chicago had a lot of B votes. And just like in that classroom, Chicago was eliminated on the first ballot. What about the example of, uh, of France? Same thing. What about the wine, beer, milk? Same thing. First stage, you drop the top candidate. So in other words, this phenomena, this phenomena where the method you're using gets rid of some problems but sure has a heck of a lot more remains. And the question then is, are there remedies? And the answer is yes. Very easy to get some. I'll give you one. It has to be modified. It's not because there's uh, subtleties involved. But the first one is, why not use the board account on this for the first stage and the second stage and the third stage? With this example here, if you go through the board account, all of the elections for all the triplets, all the pairs, and the four are all D better than C better than uh, C better than B better than A. They're all consistent. No problems at all. No wiggle woggling or anything else. And so if you use a modification of the board account on the first and then drop, et cetera, which is what they use in Australia, you get out of all of the difficulties that I've been stating. So really what have we what have we done? I think I got about three minutes, four minutes. So what have we done? Where have we come? I tried to make you highly uncomfortable. <laughs> I hope I have. <laughs> I hope you go home and say, damn, that last day club election or something else we had, I wonder if the right person really won, <laughs> okay? And the odds are that they probably did not because you probably used one of these type methods that look very good, sound very good, and are very flawed. Okay, so what is the conclusion? The problem is resolved by use of a lot of mathematics. Some of it actually coming from chaotic dynamics, uh, modifying it. And that is that by using the mathematical symmetries, much as reflected by this Rubik cube of how do you coordinate different things, it turns out that the board account is the unique choice where you can argue that the election outcome most accurately reflects the views of the voters. The unique method. It's got problems. I'll give you two. It's possible to be strategic because everything can be strategic. Now, I'm a mathematician, so I say, aha, I got something bad with the uh, board account. So I tried to prove how bad the board account was. It turned out to be less susceptible to manipulation and other methods.
but it's still susceptible. So a way to get rid of the problem might be to use it to modify other methods which reduce strategic voting, such as the Academy Awards, which you use here in Canada, and the Olympics. You will get more consistent results that more accurately reflect the views of the voters. And what happens is uh, this is actually only one of many, 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 many possible examples. Oh, the other example, ah, I forgot. I was giving uh, examples, lectures of this type, all around, but never at my home university of Northwestern University. So they said, Don, he said, why don't you give a lecture on this? I said, no. Don, why don't you give a lecture on this? No, no. Finally, I had to, I shamed into it. My worst fear came true. The next day, exactly the next day, they changed the election procedure to the board account. Why was I worried? The election method that they had been using gave distorted outcomes that kept me off of committees. <laughs> <laughs> so the board account isn't always the right one. <laughs> After all, remember, with all the different outcomes I showed you, choosing the voting method is a highly strategic approach. Okay? Now, this is only one example where mathematics plays a crucial role in understanding the problems of our society. Uh, I'll be talking tomorrow about how mathematics gives us new insight into problems from astrophysics at the Fields Institute. Again, it'll be a public, it's public is it? It's a public lecture. <laughs> and with that, I have to give a slight commercial. Uh, a lot of the examples and things comes from my book, Chaotic Elections. This is uh, American Math Society asked me to write this for laypersons, so it's uh, accessible. This one is a little bit more difficult, disposing dictators, demystifying, where I go into some of the ideas. And with that, I say thank you, thank you very much for your patience.